This is kind of outside of the scope of today's meeting, but I give presentations on this all around the state, THC Ferris, Hem Convention, Canacon, Creative Conference coming up in March, business conferences. Um, this is what I do. I'm a career farmer myself. I had to give up 15 years of solitude on my mountain doing what I love to go up to Salem to represent everybody else in the state because nobody else was stepping up to the plate to do it. And I know I'm doing the right thing because most of the time when I'm up in Salem, I get told I should be back here in Southern Oregon on my farm and half of the people that I'm working for down here don't like what's happening in Salem. They tell me I should go back up to Salem. So I know I'm doing something right. So I would like to go ahead and open this up to questions and answers because we're going to be timed out in a little less than 45 minutes here by the fact that the county commissioners are going to be taking over this meeting. But I want to give everybody food for thought and also the encouragement to really band together as a community. The number one thing that I hear are complaints that aren't actually related to marijuana. Complaints are about fencing. There's already a code about that. The complaints are about camping. There's already a statute about that. The complaints are about fires. There's already a regulation about that. The complaints about a septic system. That's a separate enforcement division. That's DEQ. That's not the state police. The one lady that um, Mark mentioned, 45 complaints to the planning office. Wasting an hour of these people's time every single week. I got the paperwork from this woman. It's a stack that's about a quarter inch thick of her complaints that she's sent to Coral Wilson's office, to the state police, to the planning office. I looked into it. I looked into the farm. I did my research. Remember, I do this as a business developer. The farm that she's complaining about is a 48 plant medical operation that's completely legal, totally regulated, and totally legit. That's 45 of the 100 and some odd complaints, unless the county comes up with documentation to prove to the contrary, that counts as one complaint to me and it's not even one that's valid. At least 95% of the complaints are generated by less than 5% of the growers. We aren't a bad community as a whole as cultivators. We've been your neighbors doing this for our entire lives. I've been participating in the medical marijuana program since the passage of Measure 67 in 1998. My next door neighbor is straight, lives 150 feet from my house, and has never had anything bad to say about my garden in 18 years. The rules that we have on the books are one thing. The rules that they want to pass mandating that we be good neighbors on, um, have you seen the law book in Oregon on that? It's about three and a half inches thick. And most of that is the common sense stuff that wouldn't need to be written in that book if we were already practicing being good neighbors. That's where this has to come from. The Planning Commission report is going to be reviewed by the county commissioners. They have three choices. Pass as written, reject it, or amend it, and then reconsider it. We would like it either to be rejected or amended and reconsidered with the participation of the cannabis cultivating community in Josephine County. You had a question? Yes, um, I was uh, wondering about the possibility that somebody could come in to the county and grow uh, and pot with pesticides and chemicals and all that. So the question is, can somebody come in and just plant a field and load it up with chemical fertilizers and pesticides? That is an activity which is largely regulated by the state. Um, this is primarily under the statutory law that applies for OLCC growing, but it also falls under Department of Agriculture regulations. They don't just control hemp, they also control pesticide application. There is a list of approved pesticides that's available through the OLCC website, um, courtesy of the Department of Agriculture. The number of approved fertilizers isn't specifically listed. Almost anything that's available for use on other crops is able to be used on cannabis. 
Um, the Sun Grown Growers Guild advocates traditional organic farming. Um, we're not allowed to use capital O organic because the federal government owns capital O organic certification. So when we talk about organic, it's little o organic because we're not allowed to play with them yet. Yeah. Um, we advocate organic farming. I, I personally, I don't just have 60 cannabis plants in the yard. Um, when the guild met with the Watershed Council, the Vineyards Association and Representative Wilson's office last March, one of the first things that came up is water use, pesticides, fertilizers. I said, okay, I have 60 cannabis plants in my yard. I'll, I'll talk about my water use on them in a second, but I want to point out that we've been in this meeting at that point for 45 minutes. Nobody asked about my 60 blueberry plants. They didn't ask about my 60 asparagus plants or my 60 grapes or my 60 tomatoes. Um, I'm a small family farmer. Small scale agriculture, RR5, 10 acres. We're only using a few acres of our land and about half of that is planted in crops that we consume, whether it be lavender and mint or cannabis or tomatoes. So everybody wants to know about the cannabis. Well, what about the fact that out of all the land that I'm farming, less than 20% of it's devoted to cannabis? When we're talking about small family farms, generally speaking, we are organic because we consume the majority of what we produce ourselves. You're talking about larger commercial operations, OLCC Tier 1 and Tier 2. Um, the labs test for an extensive list of banned substances, and in fact that has about tripled the cost of testing this year, because of the new requirements to make sure that those banned substances aren't in the finished product, weren't applied to the field. The rule when it comes to pesticides and fertilizers, if you know nothing else, know this. The label is the law. And if you are applying your own pesticides and fertilizers to your own crops for your own use or for commercial production, you are allowed to do that but you may not have an employee apply any of those chemicals unless that person has a pesticide handler's license issued by the state. And the OLCC does check on that. Okay, uh, basically kind of a two-part question. Um, like you said, it's 5% of the individuals that came in to make the Rich's office valid and then basically the, there's a major grow on Rocky Dale from my understanding, it's either Winston or Monsanto. I mean, Monsanto publicly announced that they were getting into the marijuana business even before the law was passed, and I know that they've had a major influence on the state legislature, especially for forbidding us from banning GMOs. But the, the issue is, like you said, it's, you might say, us enforcing the law, like the pesticide law that didn't get passed because of Monsanto, because they're, on your world, literally trying to protect us. Uh, Chris Hall and uh, Gina, they live down my street. They've been growing organically for at least five years. They've never done anything bad to my water. But the moment that grow on Rocky Dale started, not only have I had oily, soapy, chemically tasting water, but my water has also tasted like fish emulsion. From my understanding, that piece of property has literally tapped in multiple wells in violation of state water use laws. But how do you get corporations like that put under investigation when they're not concerned about them taking over the market, they're more concerned about taking you guys out of business. What are we supposed to do as a community to stop this from happening, especially when our water supply is in grave danger already based on what's been done on private timberland, uh, the fact that it's been sprayed multiple times with pesticides and it has been clear cut that ends up in our water supply and has been giving everybody in this county cancer. So what I would like to know is what are we going to do as a community to pull together to stop us from being poisoned for profit by some corporation that does not belong here because they're just here to make bridges and run. Okay, Junction Farmers Market. No, I know, I know. They're, I mean, that's just it. I, I love the fact that Chris and Gina are my neighbors. Uh, you also, you have other civic organizations down here. Um, the Rotary Club I addressed a half a dozen months ago. Nobody was more surprised than I was that I was addressing a Rotary Club. But um, there you go. I'm sure that on paper Monsanto doesn't own any grows in Oregon. Uh, they may have some subordinate or uh, 
Yeah, I know. Company that they own or partially own a subsidiary, I don't know. Like right um, I, I can tell you that if they're using anything that's not on the OLCC's approved list, then there is no way they can bring their products to market. And generally speaking, corporations are in it to make a buck. I don't know, I can't address specifically the situation that you're talking about on Rocky Dale Road. Right. But, um, but they are contaminating uh, like at least the Idlewild and Ken Rose neighborhood and possibly the Shearier. Rain tree, a rain tree neighborhood. So this is where having separate departments like the Department of Environmental Quality turns out to be a benefit. And this is where you actually need to be proactive yourself. And this is getting into the minutiae of it a little bit, but most growers I know test their water on a pretty regular basis because we need to know what our baseline is. The downstream um, is where the problem lies. You need to be testing your wells, and if there's a problem, you, you can bring that up with the county. You've got a problem and hundreds of dollars out of your pocket, so how do yep. we address this issue? Because it needs to be taken care of ASAP. Because the DEQ, you can't get them to respond. The water master, oh my God, she's already publicly announced that she's afraid to come out and check these girls because of guns and dogs, but yet we have the state police department that should be enforcing this law because it is a state law and state agencies. Well, this is something that maybe we need to address with the planning commission, or maybe we need to be addressing with the other agencies in our county here. Um, I would say that's, that's pretty detailed. And I, I understand the concern, believe me, because I'm an organic farmer myself, and so are my neighbors. Yeah. Um, but there are mechanisms out there to deal with that already, and it wouldn't matter if they were growing grapes or if they're growing no, cannabis. If they're using the same procedures, then you're going to have the same negative side effects. Exactly. And then it goes back to, and we have volumes of pages of law that are just basically dedicated to making people do the things that would make them good neighbors to begin with. But that's just it. How do you get somebody that's come from New York to grow for Winston, okay, or somebody who's come from Alabama that's growing for Monsanto to actually honor the fact that they're poisoning their neighbors, especially when you have Rough and Ready that's been doing it for decades, okay? So how do we get the enforcement based on what we already have in place? Like you said, why add more laws that aren't going to be enforced if we're not willing to enforce the laws that we have right now that are actually very good laws, but nobody that's in, uh, in the public offices are willing to do their job because nobody's told them to do it. That's, I agree, and that's outside, unfortunately, the scope of what I'm able to do right now, but you're going to have county commissioners standing here in an hour that would love to hear questions like that, because this is what they're going to have to do for the next four years. This is one of the things with representative government. People want to get into a pop, pro, presidential politics. I can't even say it. It leaves a bad taste in my mouth. I don't talk about presidential politics. I don't talk about national politics, and I'll tell you why. It starts local. With the exception of our current president, everybody east of the Potomac started out on city councils, planning commissions, local legislative bodies, school boards. They moved their way up to state representation, many of them then to federal representation, or they became community advocates. Ultimately, they wound up in the House, the Senate, or many of the offices on K Street at worst. Um, we can control what's going on around here. And what you're talking about is a very local issue, but it affects a good chunk of the local population. And you start out with the city government and the county government with that. And if you're not getting the response that you want, then it's time to start looking around amongst your friends and neighbors and finding somebody to fill that position the next time it comes up. These people are not irreplaceable. And by and large, they are not smarter than the average bear. Uh, I agree, but it's the employees, those that have not actually been elected to office, that literally say, well, nobody's told me to do it, so I can't do it. Let's not think for ourselves and actually do the right thing and do your job. Our planning director is an appointed official who is appointed by elected officials. If you don't like the appointments, you take your gripe to the boss, which in this case is the elected officials, the county commission. And if you don't like the commission's response, then your options are to recall the commissioner or to 
run for that office yourself. Isn't there a, more, a, a greater possibility of actually making change that we, the community, actually pull together to enact those changes and enforce those changes? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. When I went into Polk County, um, the nice people at Polk County, um, at the county commission there, it's just west of Salem, for people who don't get out very much. Um, the county commissioners there had instructed their planning commission to come up with a list of rules that looked, frankly, surprisingly similar to a lot of attachment A and half of attachment B here. And I went into Polk County, and that's a three-hour drive for me. I'm about an hour from here in northern Josephine County. So another three hours north of Polk County. And went into the meeting in Dallas and uh, explained to the people on the planning commission that what they were doing was not beneficial for their county's health and development, it's contrary to long-term planning goals two and three, ran contrary to a couple of different sections of state law, and I was able to cite them chapter and verse. And I didn't just go in there complaining that they'd been given illegal or unreasonable instructions. I went in there with a solution for them. I proposed to them the option to use the laws that their commissioners had told them to make to restrict cannabis growth and development, instead to encourage responsible cannabis growth and development with the interest of public health and safety in mind. Yes. I don't get the same reception in every county around the state. In Polk County, they were delighted that I drove three hours to be there and they gave me 15 minutes and it took 15 minutes to change the direction of that county's planning code. And this is what I was told by the head of the planning commission there. 99% of the time, the commissioners take our recommendations. And if you recommend right now that at the same time as we pass these laws, we repeal the rule against development, they will do it. I recommended it in 45 days. They went from being the most unfriendly county for cannabis west of the Cascades to being the second most friendly county to cannabis west of the Cascades. It was an appropriate application of their long-term planning use goals. By the way, most of these things were written into place 10 or 20 years before the planning commissioners were even put on that board. And those are, they're citizen servants. They're not getting paid to be in those seats. And they normally don't have anybody paying attention in those meetings, or they'll have one or two people that have a personal or business stake involved. One of the things that helps, and you've seen this at the Ambassador Auditorium, when I showed up in Polk County, it wasn't just me, I brought four dozen of my best friends with me. That makes a difference. When I show up at Ambassador, it's not just me, I bring 150 of my best friends with me. That is what makes them stop in their tracks and go, whoa. When we show up at the State House, we'll show up with enough people to fill three conference rooms and have overflow in the mezzanine on the main floor, just south of the steps. Now, we've got people sitting in lawn chairs in the lobby watching the proceedings on screens. The legislators pay attention to that. And your county representatives will pay attention to that too. If a half a dozen people show up, they don't think there's that much interest, they don't really feel compelled to change their minds. Oh, and by the way, speaking of changing their minds, we each individually pay property taxes on our own properties, and whoever it is you're saying is Monsanto's surrogate out there that owns that land, they're paying property taxes too. Not resource, They're paying property taxes too. But you come, you come to them and you say, you know, we are, we are taxpayers. We are the people that you represent. We are a body of people together. Cave Junction Farmers Market is a body of people pulling together for the same effort. By the way, as far as that circular goes, on goals one, two, and three, the OSGG has already been working on, and especially um, goal three, I work on in private business. Goal number one, sun-grown certification is gonna be out in 2017 and um, when you see sun-grown products in dispensaries and OLCC stores, that's going to be equivalent to an organic certification. 
Uh, for goal number two, we actually have a piece of legislation that we're working on right now um, addressing terroirs, or uh, what I like to call caniculture regions. In the wine industry, they're viticulture regions. Kind of similar concept. Um, you take a little bit from the hops industry, a little bit from the winemaking industry, um, a little bit from our knowledge via, especially, ironically enough, the U.S. Department of Agriculture about the growing zones that we have in Oregon, and we can make some overlays that allow for regional branding. This has already been done in California. Um, if it says Humboldt on it, it's required by state law in California to have come from Humboldt, and you can be arrested and have your products confiscated and all that fun stuff if you illegally label it Humboldt. Uh, this is one of the things I'd say we were talking about asking to be regulated like other industries. That's part of it, is actually owning your terroir, owning your caniculture region, and the integrity of the products that come from it. And I don't think Monsanto is jumping on the bandwagon to sign up with OSGG for business membership. Probably not. Mark? Yeah, I'm really glad that you're bringing up the idea about local, local control, and I hope everybody here sticks around when the commissioners uh, appear. Uh, I kind of wanted Sandy, when you take a few more minutes, but I kind of want Sandy, and she's coming from a little different angle that people might be interested in, so you know, keep going a little bit. With it. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, and I do want to go back to the fencing thing, too, because um, in the... Uh, Oh, it's an amendment. Is it an amendment? A on the fencing. They've got on. So, back to things that the state has already addressed that, because the state has addressed and decided them, are not up to reasonable time, place, and manner for localities. Uh, you can't make their recommendation as a hundred foot. Setback on um, OLCCs, yeah, here it is, on um, B8, 100 feet. Um, they can't actually do that because the state already said that it's 150 unless other mitigating circumstances are met. Um, this was an example of the additional discretion that the state legislature gave to the OLCC outside of what they normally would in order to facilitate this process. The genesis of this originated with the passage of Measure 67 in 1998, when the world was new and all, and medical plants had to be kept out of view of children because, oh my goodness, my eyes, or something like that. So um, the state statute requiring medical plants to be out of public view has not been changed since 1998. Although many other aspects of that have been modified the plants being required to be out of public view originated from the medical program, and our state legislators copy and pasted that in the joint committee and applied it to the OLCC. When the Growers Guild brought the OLCC out here to farms in Southern Oregon, uh, mine and some of my other board members included, they saw how the fencing requirement didn't work. And instead of having to inspect on a case-by-case -case basis and issue waivers for every single farm, which is time-consuming and it's very easy to say no, we created a set of rules under the OARs with that additional leeway the legislature gave us to allow for things like a 150-foot setback from a public right-of-way, eliminates the need for visibility fencing, they can still require security fencing or you can still put in fencing of your own design, but it's not a state mandate the same way. When we look at the cost of fencing acres at a time, 20 and 40,000 square foot outdoor grows, it's basically half an acre and an acre. Uh, you're looking forty to $60,000 to fence an acre if anybody wants the running rates. They decided that that was an unreasonable burden. They also put in natural barriers. You can have junipers, columnar cypress, or blackberries as a hedge fence, and the OLCC is okay with that. And they've started, finally, to acknowledge that on the OMMP side. Also, public right-of-way is something that we were given a little bit of leeway in defining. When it's 150 feet off of Williams Highway, you know they're talking about that as a public right-of-way. 
Uh, when it's 75 feet from my driveway, I live on a dead-end road. I don't have any neighbors. They don't consider that to be a public right-of-way because my driveway is actually an easement. So we are allowed to interpret that to be both more business-friendly and to allow existing growers to continue to do what they were doing without being molested. Once again, some of these recommendations at the county level, this is happening in Jackson County too, change what we've been doing since 1998. It basically goes back and says retroactively what you've been doing for the last 17 years, we didn't actually approve of the whole time we were approving of it. How well do you think that's gonna stand up in court? So question. Does tobacco, is it required to be behind a fence? What about poppies? Are they required to be behind a fence? Is there any other agricultural... You're not allowed to grow poppies for recreational purposes. No. If you're but growing you tobacco for your own use in Oregon, it's not required to be fenced. If you're growing it for commercial use, you're not in compliance with the law either. Well, that's kind of a and yes, obviously you're talking about a fencing requirement which applies exclusively to cannabis plants. And right. once again, that is because of the application of Section 333 to the new laws. Correct. And there's no uh, aroma requirements for hops or... There are no aroma requirements for hops or for master brand cabinet manufacturing mm -hmm. or for Interstate 5 or Highway 199. All of those smells travel and nobody's talking about containing those smells to the property. If they would like to talk about containing smells, um, we can go back to the state already took the discussion about smell off the table. Um, professionally speaking, I do not believe that the Planning Commission or the County Commissioners have the purview to regulate solely based on smell. They would actually have a much better argument to regulate fans based on the amount of noise that they make uh, you cannot do that, by the way, on exclusive farm use land. Uh, however, where EFU abuts residential property, there is more discretion available for the Planning Commission and for code enforcement. Which, once again, these mechanisms already exist. We don't need a whole separate section of rules that are designed to apply just to one plant because you're gonna find out like I've seen in so many other cases, that the law of unintended consequences applies here too. Jackson County just found it out in the hardest way and now they're looking at changing the portion of their county rules that defines land use because Jackson out of 36 counties in Oregon is the only county that effectively got zoned out last year by Senate Bill 1598 defining cannabis as an agricultural commodity. Yes, how come we can't make that statewide? Because it is an agricultural commodity. It is statewide. Jackson County's charter reads differently than the other 35 counties. Okay, and, and what's the matter that makes it different that allows all these regulations on an agricultural crop? We don't have enough time to go into that in our remaining time this evening. I appreciate the question, but the, the in a nutshell, Jackson County's rules are different. Jackson County also managed to, kudos to them, to get their GMO ban in place, which the state subsequently overturned Josephine County's attempt at a GMO ban because of its timeliness. That can still be revisited, but it has to be revisited at the state house. There's nothing we can do about that at the county level now. It's been taken out of our hands. Okay, I can't, I can't argue about that. Can't do that. We got a question over here. I was, this guy's a question. Yeah, I was just wondering if you could share your opinion or any amount of information about the Oregon Right to Farm and Forest Act and how that can either empower or take away power from cannabis farmers. So some rural residential property is actually also zoned as forest land. Um, zoning can get pretty interesting down here. We have something like 47 different primary zoning classifications in Oregon. Not all of them exist in any individual county. Um, if you're on forest land, um, in most counties, you have a better case for growing on your residential land than you do if your land was residential and not also a forest resource unit. 
Um, this, this gets a little bit into it, but... So there are 18 bills at the State House right now, totaling about a thousand pages we're going to be discussing over the next couple of months. Uh, they all can't pass. Some of them are mutually exclusive. One of the bills that's not on the docket, and there are two that I'm aware of that haven't been listed yet, um, one of those two bills deals with RR5 properties specifically, and we're even talking about um, the feasibility of getting it passed if it starts out at RR2.5s. Um, it would take all of this discussion at the county level off the table if passed. Uh, basically, it would establish that you have the same right to grow cannabis on your property that you've been utilizing every year since 1998. Underneath Measure 67, it would eliminate the need for grandfathering. It would not affect the OLCC requirement to have a well certified or water trucked in if you're going to be an OLCC licensee, but as a medical licensee, it would eliminate this discussion at the county level completely. If you want to see that kind of legislation passed, that's what I work on. I've told people, and no joke, there's something that happened to the state with marijuana in the last couple of years that you like, you're welcome. If there's, if there's something that happened at the state level with marijuana in the last couple of years that you didn't like, I was the first one to get kicked in the, over that. So I've been really fighting this hard, but I cannot do it without support. We can't get outspent 15 to 1 at the state house and retain residency. We learned that the hard way. We have 100,000 people that are directly involved with the medical program alone. If each one of those people would have given $10 to a primary organization like the Sun Grown Growers Guild or Compassionate Oregon, we would have had the leverage we needed at the State House to win. We lost because we got outspent. We got outspent by privateer holdings. We got outspent by Dixie Elixirs. We got outspent by the Marley brand. It was because the local farmers, the small farmers, the rural residential properties that you're concerned about wouldn't do anything to help with this effort. It can't carry itself. And I would like to give Sandy the opportunity to come up here for a few minutes and go more into the property rights aspect of this. Um, talking about cannabis is one thing, but this affects everybody. Sandy, will you please come up here and give us the any, any skinny on the property rights aspects? Sandra Casanelli, former county commissioner and one champion of property rights in Josephine County. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I have some handouts for you. It's the, the four uh, pages in the text amendment that deals with code enforcement and violations. And I also have a no trespassing sign that you can put on your property. It will, supposedly will keep out the bureaucrats off of your land. Um, do posted no trespassing and they're not supposed to go through. Um, I want to give you a little procedure about what's happening at the county. Um, I, you know, I'm not involved with anything to do with pot and, you know, I don't recommend it to everybody, but you know something? I find it really egregious that these commissioners are shoving the code enforcement and the hearings officers down our throats through a text amendment for uh, restrictions on marijuana growing. Uh, it is totally not appropriate, um, especially since um, in November 5th, 2013, we had two measures on the ballot. Uh, one was measure 1754 for a county code enforcement. It was defeated by 79.45% of the electorate. Also at this time, there was a county hearings officer, Measure 1755, voted down 80.33% of the electorate. This is overwhelming opposition to these two, two um, uh, ideas. So once that's done, fast forward about three years, three and a half years into Cheryl Walker um, and uh, Keith Heck and Simon Hare's um, term for the previous board, and they did something very egregious. Um, in a six month period between Halloween and Christmas, they, they went on a frenzy trying to pass everything that had failed um, during their three years in office, three and a half years in office. October 30th was Halloween, and 
and um, of last year. And they wanted, through the Rural Planning Commission, a text amendment for this marijuana growing that included code enforcement. The commissioners, uh, the planning commission itself voted to take that code enforcement aspect of the text amendment out. And they also did not make a recommendation to the BCC because they felt the text amendment was not appropriate. Well, the BCC and the Planning Commission decided, oh, you know what, because they made no recommendation, that means they're all for, for, for it, so we're going ahead with this, which was not um, really the intent of that, that meeting. Then on November 16th, Cheryl Walker and Keith Heck voted this in. Uh, Simon Hare was mysteriously absent, um, but gave no reason for his absence. Um, they voted in a resolution to extend the authority of hearings officers. This was done inappropriately. There was no ordinance number with this resolution. And the, the county law is an ordinance. A resolution cannot trump county law, an ordinance. We used to say a resolution is about as um, um, valid as the paper it's printed on. It's basically nothing. So this is a procedural um, error. What they should have done is they should have gone to the people through an ordinance to see if they wanted this code and this hearings officer. They did not do this. They gave, which was really egregious. Um, they in that this, they gave the authority, the Board of County Commissioners with the exclusive authority to amend the text of the code by legislative action. It wasn't by a vote of the people. This was really um, kind of underhanded. Uh, um, then, the next, following week, November 22nd was a real doozy. They wanted the, uh, a law enforcement taxing district, although the electorate voted down um, uh, uh, a levy by 60% of the vote in order um, to enhance law enforcement. That same meeting, they voted in a library taxing district. Very, very sneaky what they did. We voted this down in, t in November of 2014 by 50, almost 53% of the vote. But what they did is they saw all the areas, the precincts that voted for the last taxing, library taxing district and now you people are the ones that are going to pay for the entire library system along with the people in Wolf Creek um, because uh, isn't that fine? You voted for it originally, so we're going to now make you the guys that are going to have to pay for the libraries forever. That same meeting, they increased the fees for the planning office and then just before Christmas, December 7th, they had the first reading to establish um, fire standards. They did this all within a six week um, uh, um, uh, time. And it was all done between Halloween and Christmas when everybody doesn't have, want to have anything to do with county politics. So I, I want to tell you that um, they're in this, um, text amendment, if you look on, on the back page, it does say, it does make reference to a hearings officer. So this is just not code enforcement, this is a whole bailiwax of, of um, uh, appointed officials by the commissioners who have no accountability to the public. Uh, and they are going to be um, um, doing some very, very nasty things. Um, the, let me see, let me see, let me see. Oh, basically what um, it, this does is it takes the ability that you have now, if the planning director makes a bad decision, you can go before the BCC and, and appeal that decision. And the B, you know, you're, you're, you're going before three people and you've got a pretty good chance of having your, that decision overturned. If they go through with this hearings officer, you're gonna be ha making decisions from the hearings officer, but it cannot be 
um, appeal to the BCC. They're eliminating the BCC in this whole process so that you apply directly to LUBA. And LUBA is a very, very expensive process because you have to have legal counsel representing you. So um, this is so bad. Um, uh, it's just a bureaucratic nightmare um, uh, coming down, down the, the pike. Um, let me see what else I want to tell you. Um, it, it essentially makes the, the planning director the citation czarina, um, where, you know, they... The current process is very cumbersome. They give you a 30 days notice, a, a seven day notice, a 30 day notice, a 15 day notice, then a seven day notice to comply. And, and if you don't comply with whatever um, violation they, they think you, you know, you're, you're doing, um, then they, the planning office can go to the commissioners and say, look, we can't get uh, these people to comply, let's take them to court. And so that's the, the process that's in place now. But if this goes through, that it gives way, 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 way too much authority um, to the community development director, the planning director. It gives her the ability to issue citations and um, all of this should have been done by ordinance rather than by a text amendment. So, yes, all right, the book is here. Here's some handouts. One question for Sandra, um, if possible. Mm -hmm. um, just would like to know, um, is the action that is being taken by the staff of the county commissioners, is it because they are morally, ethically, and uh, otherwise opposed to the cannabis industry, or do they really honestly care about the minutia and the little details that they're trying to pick apart and make happen? Uh, I think they want the revenue. I think uh, they ha are under pressure because people have been complaining, and and but I don't think this is the way to do it. Um, uh, um, it's gonna it's gonna make it very very difficult. It, it we're gonna be like Jackson County where we have a hearings officer and code enforcement, and and the fines are gonna come and they're gonna have too way too much authority over us. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, we got three minutes. There's a petition circulating. If you could bring it back to me before we're done tonight. And I urge everybody here to hang out in four minutes. The county commissioners will be here. They want your input. If this meant anything to you at all, please hang around. We've got it from a number of different angles, but there's a petition circulating. And all this is, is to show the commissioners how we feel. And I'm going to keep going. I'm not going to stop at 60 or 70. And uh, we got about one minute. Thank you again. Please hang around. Thanks, Rock. And thank you, Kath, uh, Sandy. Welcome. Um, I just want to speak for a moment to the handout that hopefully everyone has a copy of, although we may have run out of copies. Um, this is uh, a mission statement and various goals, one through seven, which Chris Hall, who's the current president of our uh, CJ Farmers Market, has produced. Thank you, Chris. Good effort. Um, this is a draft. This is for your input. We've already had some really valuable input today about uh, uh, trimmers and um, I just wanted to say that we, we're not setting up in opposition to uh, the Sungrown Guild, rather we recognize that not all of us can afford to spend an hour and a half to get to Williams for their meetings and so we want to make a sister organization if you will which will work in uh, tandem with uh, SOG. Um, and uh, it's in its infancy, so your input today or this week, in the next two weeks, is going to be very valuable. And if we don't have your input, we'll be the poorer for it. Chris. And yeah, so uh, to speak to what John was saying about being the sister organization, um, I believe you've got to pay $500 to join the Sun Grown. This is 50. This is not about hiring tons of lawyers and lobbyists to go raid Salem. This is about also just the Illinois Valley mm -hmm. and not larger than that. So 
We feel strongly that what we can do is incorporate cannabis farmers into the Cape Junction farmers market and bring in, uh, bring those folks into the market in as much as it's a food market and expand it beyond just three hours on Friday, but to the larger market economy and the market for agriculture. It's the elephant in the room and we ought not ignore it anymore. And the whole point about this is that we're providing an inst institutional structure which will pull together the interests of all the cannabis farmers in the Illinois Valley and with the idea of eventually developing a brand which will uh, identify, identify the product that we produce as um, honey excellent. Mm. Um, any questions? Where would I um, get in touch with the Junction Farmers Market? That's the I'm the secretary, but he's the okay. president. Would I be allowed to donate produce to this market if I can prove that it was organically grown in It doesn't have to be organically grown. Right. It doesn't have to be organically grown. Thank you all. Please hang around. We're supposed to be done by six, and we are. Thank you. Mm -hmm.